As I said, the two talks, Bobby's talk and the one that's going to follow, are sort of interrelated because they both shed a light on how data industries work. Um, our next two speakers both work at Privacy International, based in London. Uh, the wonderful Friederike Kalkoiner is a technology and policy expert with a background in philosophy, and she leads Privacy International's data exploitation program. She also has a book coming out soon. It's called Datengerechtigkeit. It's going to be published uh, in German by Nikolai Publishing and Intelligence in October. So that's very exciting, and we're all looking forward to reading that. And she's joined today by Ali Callender, who is a Scots Law Qualified Solicitor with Privacy International and responsible for their legal advocacy and data protection. She also leads the legal uh, global research team at Privacy International. And we're very glad they're both here today. The talk is going to shed a light on companies that are sort of hiding away from the public eye, sort of public companies out of the limelight and out of the media scrutiny, but that do play a key role in today's data industry. And so they're going to basically show the effects of an underregulated data ecosystem and are going to take a critical look at the impact GDPR is having on this and steps that we can all take to sort of hold these invisible companies responsible and hold them to account um, for dealing with our data in a more responsible way. And off you go. The applause for them, please. Es ist immer ein bisschen awkward, wenn jemand mit deutschem Akzent Englisch redet. Äh, deshalb nur zur Erklärung, wir geben den Talk auf Englisch, damit ihr meine tolle Kollegin Amy kennenlernen könnt. Das ist der einzige Grund. Und auch, weil ich nicht alle deutsche Worte, deutsche Worte kenne. Um, I'm going to start with the most infamous, previously unknown, but now very known company. In 2015, three months before the election in Nigeria, a, a billionaire or millionaire called Cambridge Analytica. And the reason he called them was because he panicked at the idea of a change of government. According to research by The Guardian, the millionaire paid Cambridge Analytica 2.8 million US dollar uh, to orchestrate a campaign for a re-election of the then president, Jonathan Goodluck, or Goodluck Jonathan. One reason why this millionaire was freaking out uh, was because the, his opponent, then the opposition leader, Buhari, um, had hired a strategist by a former Obama strategist and delivered a message of hope and change and that message seems to have been resonating at the time. SCL Election, that is the parent company of Cambridge Analytica, countered this message of hope with a violent attack video. The video is based on archive footage of Nigeria's violent past, and I'm not going to show it to you because it's extremely graphic. You see dead bodies, you see people being murdered on screen. Only because of res <coughs> apologies, I'm a bit sick. Only because of investigations by The Guardian do we know where this video originated from and that this was no coincidence. This violent video was a deliberate strategy. The video was made, and this is a quote by a former um, contractor, it was, a, it was voter suppression of the most crude and basic kind. It was targeted at Buhari voters in Buhari regions to specifically scare the shit out of them and stop them from voting. Six months have passed since this revelation uh, and since the, the latest iteration of the Cambridge Analytica scandal. But um, if you have been following uh, the hearings in the US, particularly in the Congress and in the Senate, you get the impression that the core of this entire scandal is actually quite simple. <coughs> This scandal happened because bad actors, many of them foreign, have misused platforms in bad ways. 
And the only responsibility or the flaw of platforms is that they haven't spotted them early enough and that they have reacted too late. We strongly believe that this narrative is way too easy, and there's actually evidence to back this up. I'm not sure if um, many of you are aware, but in the United Kingdom, there's an ongoing investigation into personal information and political influence by the Data Protection Authority, which is called the Information Commissioner's Office. What's quite interesting about this investigation are many things. I encourage you all to read the report. But what's most interesting, I find, is its scope. Initially, they targeted 172 organizations of interest, and they're looking into a whole range of sectors. It's political parties, credit referencing agencies, data brokers, social media companies, and even universities. It's one of the largest investigations by a data protection authority. Um, and here's another quite interesting finding that came off the back of this. What you see here is a parenting block. It's called Emma's Diary. It's really owned by a marketing company. But during this scandal, we learned that ahead of the 2017 election, the Labour Party bought uh, data on one million voters, uh, former new and expectant mothers. And they bought this data via data broker from the parenting blog Emma's Diary. We also learned that, that all three major political parties use software to predict people's ethnicity and their age. So the key lesson from this report is that this is how data works today. There are thousands of companies you've never heard of which use data in a way that many people would find extremely uncomfortable. Excuse me? Um, there's also sometimes the sense that nothing really came out of this scandal. So I also just want to highlight that actually a couple of things have happened. And even though we're still waiting for the final report, the ICO has already taken regulatory action. Um, they have sent warning letters to 11 political parties. Um, they have uh, expressed their intent to find Facebook with uh, 500,000 pounds, the maximum fine uh, pre-GDPR. Um, they are also started a criminal prosecution of SCL Election Limited. Again, the key lesson is what we're faced with is a systemic problem. Um, we're not just dealing with bad actors that are misusing platforms, but there are non-consumer facing companies, data brokers, credit referencing agencies that misuse data. And the reason why I brought up Nigeria at the beginning is because it's a good example that shows what's really at stake, um, especially in countries with volatile, more volatile political contexts, but this also applies everywhere. Here's a quote from the Information Commissioner's officer, Office. In her final report, or in her intermediary report, here's what she said. Trust and confidence in the integrity of our democratic process is disrupted because the average voter has little idea what's going on behind the scenes. This is the reason why we have decided that we are going to use GDPR, so stronger data protection laws, to probe non-consumer facing companies, specifically data brokers and companies in the ad tech industry. <laughs> Sorry to interrupt, can someone fix the slides? Because you will have to read them for the next section. So um, as Frederica mentioned, what we're in the process of doing is probing these non-consumer facing data companies. We've chosen them because we really see them as the epitome of data exploitation and the antithesis of what the data protection laws are supposed to prevent. Their whole purpose is to maximize the amount of data that they have and repurpose it in different ways. So I just want to run you through four different things in GDPR that changed which make it a more effective tool to both investigate and uh, hold to account these companies. So the first one here is extraterritoriality. Um, as you might know, this was a big change. Um, with GDPR, kind of the law stretched itself out to reach out to companies beyond those that are based in the EU. And that's the case with many, many 
non-consumer facing data companies, these invisible data companies. For example, in 2016, um, a German journalist and data science scientists obtained anonymized data of three million Germans, and from those data, they could identify both uh, judges' porn preferences and the medical um, medication of a German MP. So this is a problem everywhere, where you have massive companies assuming, amassing more and more data about people, and the fact that they're not just based here means that the law had to expand to try and incorporate them. And in fact, the ICO in the UK has issued its first enforcement order against a company not based in the EU, and it was a data company called Aggregate IQ based in Canada, who they highlighted in their election investigation, where they required them to delete all the data they held about UK citizens. Another change has been around transparency and accountability. And apologies for, for my kind of dry uh, legal analysis of it. But I think these are really two key principles that have really changed the way um, that we can find out information about how companies are using data and then also to hold them to account. So this addition of transparency to the law, it applies both in terms of the rights information that we have now under the law this means that if you do, if you are interested and you do delve into, into companies' privacy policies, they might have revealed a little bit more about themselves, or they might not have. They might not have met the requirements that they were required to meet to tell us, for example, about their profiling activities. And in terms of um, the way they're supposed to explain this information, it's supposed to now be intelligible. And another part of it is that you can now exercise your rights for free. And the provision around accountability is really flips the burden. It flips it off the consumer or the individual and onto the companies. It's up to them to demonstrate how they comply with the law. And it's not up to you to have to point out that they don't. So another change, legal basis. This is something that's always been the case. There's been very limited grounds um, under which people's data could be processed. In fact, at the moment, there's only six. And in a commercial setting, there's really only three that are relevant. And this is where consent comes into play. Have you consented to the way your data is being processed? And what we've seen is that companies are still trying to fit this to their narrative. And this has really been the first line of attack by civil society. Had the complaints from Noib, from La Quadrature du Net, and the report by the Norwegian Consumer Council, some examples and there will be more to come. But there's two other legal bases that companies are applying on to do what, are relying on to do what they want with people's data. They say it's necessary for the performance of a contract or based on the leg legitimate interest. For example, I recently read one data broker's explanation of why it was in their legitimate interest to process your data because it was in their interest to market more goods and products in order to pay their staff and pay taxes which just shows how this can be widely interpreted. However, regulators have come out strongly before, and they will um, again on these, and that's where I think civil society will also have a role to play. And a final area that's also relevant and new in GDPR is around profiling. So many of the kind of most exploited data data practices that we see relate to profiling. And that's really what the whole Cambridge Analytica scandal was about. And what GDPR does do for the first time is it does put down a definition of profiling and requires certain requirements in terms of both the information and then um, also the scenarios in which it can be used. And this is where it's interesting that in the report Frederica mentioned from the ICO, they really picked up on that micro-targeting by political parties and campaigns may fall within the automated decision making provisions and there are thus limitations on it. But there are also challenges and like any law it requires constant vigilance. And we know that it's been largely disregarded in the past which is why we need to ensure that it's not used and interpreted by the powerful in a way that empowers them, but in a way that helps uh, readdress the imbalance of power. And I think in this we all have a role to play. 
and Frederica will explain a bit how. Thank you, Aileen. Um, so this is the legal analysis, and, and I, I, the discourse around GDPR is quite different in the UK than it is in Germany. It's actually not that negative in the UK. Um, and Ingo asked me in an interview for Netzpolitik whether I, I would agree that with claims that people say GDPR is so vague we would be better off without it. And I think these reasons show that, no, I don't think we would be. Um, so what needs to happen now? Um, we're not done with our uh, investigations and complaints, so I can't share many details, but I think there are many things that we all should be doing more and that we have been doing and that many organizations are already doing, but we just wanted to share them with you again. And here is the first one, and I think you only notice how important that is when you talk to people in countries that do not have data rights. They do not have the right to ask for access, to ask the company what they hold on them. And we all should be using and testing these rights uh, much more, also to investigate, but also just to make sure that they're being enforced as strong as possible. Here are just three examples. Um, I haven't read it yet, but I heard that uh, Katasha's book is amazing, where she just asked lots of companies what kind of data they have on her. Um, another question we should be asking is, is this really everything when you return your data back? I returned my data from Spotify, someone else got back to them and said, you must be kidding me, that's not it, and they received much more detailed data. And the more people do that, the better, comp the better practices company will ha companies have in place to respond to these requests. Um, the third one is also sort of when the controller, so the company that's processing the data is based in the EU, but the subject is outside the EU. This is what Professor David Carroll has done with Cambridge Analytica. He has sued the company uh, to give him access to his data, and this is, was a month-long process, but ultimately he won, and the company is now required, even though it's insolvent, is required to give him his data. Here is a, th a second one. So as Ailey explained, as, and as many companies complain sometimes, there are many ambiguities in GDPR that are simply not that clear. This is why we need legal precedents uh, and we also need to demand and shape additional guidance that clarifies these things. But we need to make sure that these are in the interests of people, of consumers, of voters, of each and every one of us, and not in the interest of those who abuse our data. Here are just some ambiguous areas where it's really not always clear, where I think we should all be pushing to make sure that they're interpreted in the right way. Legitimate interest, when can a company rely on legitimate interest, and when on consent, Auf Deutsch ist das Zustimmung, Einstimmung oder das legitime Interesse der Firma. Um, Zustimmung. That's why we're doing this in English. Um, and here's the third one. And I also think we should all be filing more complaints more regularly. And I'm saying that this is not the same as Abmahnwelle, uh, which some have been warning about, that with GDPR we will have tons of complaints to small bloggers and everything. It's not what I mean. What I mean is that um, each and every day, I see companies that are blatantly non-compliant. And here's just one example from this week. So this is a, I'm not gonna say which website it is, it's very big. And they allow hundreds of companies to track my entire browsing history and the consent box is pre-ticked. That's just not ambiguous, it's just clearly um, uh, raises lots of questions. So basically, why are we talking about all this? Because what we precisely don't want to see is data exploitation by design and by default. And this is unfortunately what we're seeing in many scenarios. So for example here, it's a Chinese phone um, which has embedded into and built in the, the location and the unique identifiers of the device as shared with the Taiwanese advertising company. This would be hugely problematic here. And it serves as a reminder that whilst they not be, might not be perfect, data protection laws do afford some form of defense, even that first line of defense. And there are many countries that still don't have them and, or where they need reform. And what we're seeing now is there are many bills and there are uh, many reform processes underway, which we are supporting with our partners around the world. But at the same time, it's, not, it's one piece of the puzzle. And I think, as Wolfie said, we, we do need to think beyond data protection as well. So using 
the rights that we have, filing complaints when we see practices that blatantly disregard the laws that are still new, will help to push these companies to hold them to account. And they don't just operate here, they operate elsewhere as well, and that can make a difference. And yeah, it's also up to us to think beyond this about what other laws and tools that we have, whether it's competition law, whether it's product liability law, whether it's, it's not just the law, um, and what other mechanisms we have to hold these companies that are largely invisible to us, that we often don't know their names, and um, to hold them to account. And you should all join us. Thank you.